Hey guys, I'm Teresa Ingalls, and this is Keep It Historic. Today I'm at Salem Missionary Baptist Church in Lilburn, Georgia. The Stone Front Church was built in 1961 and was later expanded in the 80s. I'm speaking to Gregory Bailey, whose family has deep roots in the church and in the town. We can trace my father's family um, back to about 1834, and we do that through the Salem Church, which was started by the Carroll family on the Carroll Plantation. The Carroll family came here um, in the 1820s, late, mid to late 1820s. We find them recorded in 1830 in the census living in Gwinnett County. Uh, we're told that in about 1834, they built four buildings. Uh, four were residences for 15 enslaved Africans, and one was a meeting house. Uh, that defied the law of the day because slaves were not to meet, but the Carols, for whatever reason, allowed them to meet one Sunday a month. Word got out, other families came, that's when my descendants came. Uh, this wall is a wall of early members of Salem, and all of them are related to me. This is Reverend Waddy and Clara Stevens. Uh, Waddy was a minister who was an interim pastor of Salem for some years. This is his wife, Clara. This is also Grandma Clara, uh, who I'm told lived to be 102. They were early slave members of Salem. Now that worship was orchestrated by the owners of the enslaved Africans. So that worship service was certain scriptures. Uh, slaves obey your masters, being submissive. But we also know by history and by word of mouth that people often said in the evening, but it was not in the evening, in the early morning, those same worshipers, those same enslaved Africans would worship in what was called a brush arbor, where they had their own preacher and could worship in the manner that they chose and not be under the auspices of those who owned them. Worshiping in the Brush Arbor afforded some freedom of religious expression, but the Civil War and Emancipation finally allowed Salem Church to truly break free. Either right in the midst of the war or right after the war, the Carroll family gave property to their enslaved Africans. On that property, they became sharecroppers. And it was on that property in the 1860s that our records show that they organized as the Salem Baptist Church of God, uh, no longer being under the auspices of the Carroll Plantation. They could have their own worship the way they intended to worship. And somewhere in the 1890s, they had saved money as sharecroppers, went back to the Carroll family, those who were still living, and gave them the deed or gave them their property back because these determined people declared that they no longer wanted ties with someone that once owned them. So they left the property and bought property in downtown Milburn and they built that church at the corner of Lula and Poplar Street. In the 19, late 1920s, through the 30s, people started to move away, 40s people started to move away, and there were two major reasons, boll weevil and racism. I'm told family stories of severe racism, which is why none of the African-American communities survived in Lilburn. Uh, half of my father's 13 siblings relocated to Chicago, Illinois, uh, beginning at the end of World War I. The why is because my father's eldest brother came back from World War I after having served and being honorably discharged from the U.S. Army, decided to wear his Army uniform into Gloucester on Gloucester Road in Lilburn, went to a store that was located not far from their house. He and his brother-in-law, who was also a World War I vet, when they got to the store, went in and purchased some snacks, purchased Cokes, sodas. When they came out, there was an angry mob that said, how dare you wear this country's uniform? You're not worthy to represent this country. They beat him, uh, 
tied him behind the car and drug him. And then they brought him to the home of my grandparents and threw his body on the porch. They surrounded the house and would not let them carry my uncle away from the property. Story says that as the evening was coming, at the twilight, that um, the town doctor rode up uh, and said, you know, said, Jewel, I can't treat Clifford. Clifford was my uncle. Said, I can't treat Clifford here. His damages are too severe. I don't have anything to treat him with, but I'll help you get him to help. Uh, my father said that at 10 years old, his father instructed he and all the other male children to come with him. They hitched up the wagon, put my uncle on the back of the wagon, and rode all night to downtown Atlanta to Grady Hospital. He stayed in the hospital several weeks. He did survive. When he got out of the hospital, he immediately went somewhere in Atlanta and bought a truck, came back to Lilburn, got off the train, went in the house, packed his clothes, got on the train the next day, left Gwinnett County and never returned even to his parents' funeral services because he'd been treated so terribly uh, in this area. After that, five of his younger siblings actually followed him to Chicago. Hmm. The church did really, really, really reduce his numbers. The church congregation shrunk as families experiencing racism moved away. The wooden church building, at first a sign of hope for a new era, was now in significant disrepair. The community decided it was time to build again. This time, the building would be smaller. When they tore down the old building, they found two cases of dynamite in the ceiling. Uh, and actually, my father and his best friend did not reveal that story until they were well into their 70s. Hmm. Um, they found two cases of dynamite. They said that it had been lit and they could see the ashes burning almost up to the explosion point and then it didn't go off and we know that the finger of God snuffed it out. Present church building, um, they started to build it in the late 50s. They moved into it in 1961 um, because they paid as they could go. They decided they did not want to borrow any money so they would build as they could pay for it. Um, but I was born in 1957, so I grew up in the 60s. Uh, we would drive back here to church. And as a child, an experience that really sticks in my mind is that coming down Lawrenceville Highway, just as we would start to get into Lilburn, the Klan would meet there during the day. Uh, and we would drive by and they would be passing out flyers and information uh, in their clan uniforms. And, you know, of course, when they saw us, they would say words that we did not want to hear and things that were not uh, very nice at all. But a determined people, we kept, we kept coming and, and doing what we needed to do. Despite the significant challenges members of the church faced, Salem was about to enter a growth spurt, see their membership soar, and once again need a new building, but this time one that could hold thousands. Church really began growing in the 1980s. And then the huge spurt came after 1987 when Dr. Richard Haynes was called as pastor. And people really, really started to come. And those 60 people who had been there on Sunday morning became thousands of people who were now here on Sunday morning. Uh, our current membership was a little over 2,700. Wow. And the church had more of a community thrust and there was more outreach. Salem became more of a community-minded church. You know, as we naturally have a thrust to young people and teenagers and children. But another major thrust I think that makes us unique is we have a major thrust to seniors. The um, food pantry that gives food to the community twice a week. Grief share that's open to the community. With that is our Stephen ministry. We're also what's called a Station of Hope, a GED and basic skills program. We've adopted Lilburn Middle School. 
That's just a few of the things that we do. Keeps you busy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Sounds like. My last question is, uh, what was the motivation for creating Heritage Hall? We purchased Heritage Hall in 2000, but when we bought it, we knew that it was once the same property that our enslaved ancestors had worshipped. Uh, now, I said we had a lot of seniors. One of those seniors was my father's youngest sister, who by the time we purchased Heritage Hall was well into her 90s. But I called her my family archivist. And she had, she just passed away a few months ago at 104. But she had all kinds of materials, all kinds of pictures, in addition to the fact that my father had been the church clerk. So I had access to records that dated back to the 1860s. It was that thought coupled with the vision of Pastor Haynes that history is also local. So while our children are learning about everybody else, they need to learn about where they are and who they are and be able to walk into a building and say, this is what happened for us to get here. Uh, and that's what Heritage Hall is. So this is a place for our members to see, for our children to see, but not just for them to see, but for the entire community to see. Lilburn is a different place now than it was in the 1800s, but we need to know what happened in the 1800s so that we can commit ourselves to continue to keep Lilburn a different place and continue to make Lilburn grow and thrive as one worldwide community. So not only is this a success story of the preservation of a church building, but it's also the success story of a community. The story of how the past influences the present, but doesn't define the future. And that's a lesson from history that we can all learn.